Thank you for tuning in for this edition of the She Dreams in Color video series. Of course, we want to get our trigger warnings out before you start watching. This interview does involve conversations around suicide, drug and alcohol use, depression, and gun violence. My voice is just to penetrate and let you know, hey man, you can be somebody despite any obstacle, despite any hurdle. You can, you can be somebody. Life's a short and precious thing. Sweet like honey and it sure can sting. Sure can sting. Thank you for joining us for another edition of the She Dreams in Color video series. I'm joined here today by Denier Davis, an artist who I found through Instagram, who did some work for a friend, and I loved it because it was love. <laughs> As you can see, love is a theme. Um, and so we're going to talk about your occupation and your obstacle. That's what we do here on She Dreams in Color. So thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. All right, so I love to just jump right in. Um, occupation. Talk to me about your occupation and how you found your way into this. Oh, man, my occupation. So I'm an artist, a full-time artist. This is what I do. I quit my job uh, June. I don't remember the exact date, but it was June this year. I quit my job. This year? Yeah, actually, I walked away from my job in 2021. Yeah. Um, I've walked away from a job before, so this time was a little easier. Uh, and I walked away to pursue art the first time. So my occupation full-time artist and how I stumbled up I stumbled up across this thing oh man stuttering sorry <laughs> I'm sorry That's your energy okay. is so like super strong all right so like I uh yeah I was playing basketball I was a ball player I was trying to go overseas and I ended up tearing my ACL and uh I was devastated so during the rehab process I was working at U.S. Foods at the time. I ended up drawing Peace, Love, and Happiness, and I posted it on social. I think social media had just started. So one of my homeboys at the job saw it, and he was like, I want you to do my kid's name. And at the time, I was thinking, man, this would be like a quick little come up. You know what I'm saying? Nothing nothing that I would ever dream would take me as far as it has taken me. So that's how I started my art career was I drew his kid's name. Everybody at the job wanted their kid's name done. The next thing I know, I was like, man, I started venturing out, drawing things, writing goals, and it just took off. So that's, I love I, this. One of the things uh, I want to accomplish with this video series is to show people that you're called, like there's a talent on your heart. The universe finds you and uses you as a vehicle. And, um, but we're told you can't do that. That won't make money. This isn't for women. This isn't for women like you, you know, um, We've never seen that before or, or whatever it may be. Um, but when people such as yourself jump into that and go, it just flourishes. You you can't fight it. It's crazy. Uh, as I, as the journey, right, and each day I spend with myself, I think back like, man, in fourth grade or fifth grade, we had career day. And uh, I wanted to be a tattoo artist. And she was like, that's not a career. So think about that. Think about I was told at a very young age, maybe nine or ten. Right. So I'm still developing and in my childhood years, something I can't do, then of course I believe that I can't do it or that that's not a career. And I'm like, man. So I put it in the back burner and ball became life. And uh, being a, a female and being an artist, yeah, it's tough because every industry I don't, or every field is, is predominantly male. You know what I'm saying? So it's really, it's tough, but you break through. You keep fighting and you keep pushing, especially like, you know, I can do this. This is what, this is my call. This is what I'm meant to do. So that's where I'm at. But for a lot of your life, you felt called to play basketball, right? Mm -hmm. What is that like to know that you have a purpose, but there's something bigger, something different? What is that like? Have you been able to kind of accept fully? Now in 2021, yes, at first, no, like... I was like, man, I still want to play, even after rehab, right? Like, my family's like, give it up. I'm like, you know, like, how do you tell someone to just give up something that they're truly passionate about? Like, they wake up, they go to the gym, and they dribble a ball to the gym. They carry a ball to the restaurant, in the car, basketball shoes, in shooting, in their sleep. Like, how do you tell someone to just give up something they believe in, something that they believe is going to help their family, something that's in their heart? Like, how? And at first, when the art happened, it really was. It was just about the money because I couldn't see anything with it. I couldn't see where it was taking me because I had a vision that ball was going to take me somewhere. And as the transition happened, I realized, man, this is a real thing. Right. Like this art thing is a real thing. It's really artists out here. And as I started learning art, like my own history, I was like, well, how can you incorporate the lessons you learned from basketball 
into art and be able to change it? How can you incorporate the lessons you've learned through your life and just the trials and tribulations into this whole thing that you have been called to do, like answer the phone? And I'm like, man, all right. You know, so I started accepting it that art was really my thing like five years ago. But I really have accepted that this is what we're going to do. And this is where we're at for the rest of my life because I still love basketball. I thoroughly enjoy watching it. Um, I can't say I don't dream about <laughs> going overseas to play, but art, art is uh, it's where it's at. That's where I'm at. And a lot of your work incorporates basketball. Like you said, you have you paint on basketballs, tennis shoes, or basketball shoes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know I'm not using the right terminology. We can say tennis, tennis shoes, sneakers. Shoes. Yeah, yeah, sneakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm a, a basketball mom, and I yeah. can't think of what they're called. It's terrible. Yeah, it's, cool. <laughs> it's embarrassing. It's cool. It's cool. Um, so uh, how old were you when the ACL injury happened? In 2011, the art happened. We had the rehab. We had the depression. Then we had the, you know, the process. And then 13, it started really like, all right, this is something, but I don't know what. I don't so know. did your experience with depression come from your injury and that complete shift in your life? I think, yes, but I also think it came from a lot of things leading up to that. And everything probably just hit me at one time. And then just not being able to do this thing no more really tipped me over the edge. You know what I'm saying? Tipped the cup over. And that was probably the final straw. Mm -hmm. Like. Life up until that point had been a, a struggle. And uh, so at that point, I'm like, basketball is kind of all I have. And I mean, I had a job. I didn't understand gratitude. I had a job. So, you know what I'm saying? I have a job. I got my family. I got life. But in my mind at the time, ball is everything. Mm -hmm. That's all I could see. And so I guess when that happened and they were like, man, you got to have surgery. It's going to take a year. I'm like, a year? You know how much time off a year is going to cost me? And so... The depression came, and it's like, you're not going to be able to hoop no more. What you going to do? And it's like, you know, the sign was right there. You got this gift. It's just you really got to work. The same uh, energy you put into basketball and working hard, it's the same energy you need to put into this. And you need to, you know, figure out where this is going to take you and what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So one thing you mentioned um, that is a common theme we hear, and part of our motivation is you didn't see a lot of women in art. Mm -hmm. um, do you? Do you look back now and say, I saw a few examples, or did you have to search them out once you started getting into art? Did you have to search out for who's done this before? How did that go? So it was kind of freaky, right? Like, I was like, man, I just got on YouTube. That's what happened first, right? And I'm like, man, we're going to learn how to paint. And when I learned how to paint, I was like, man, we're going to learn how to spray paint. So actually, I never really paid attention to what was happening outside around because I didn't know this was really a thing right and I was like to January I can't remember the exact time 13 14 2014 so it's 2014 I was like I'm gonna start doing shoes that's how all this happened so I didn't even know any artists nobody in my neighborhood was an artist they didn't even know I was in the in the room cooking up you know what I mean I'm cooking up this whole pot they don't even know what I'm doing uh, only people really at work who was telling their friends but nobody I didn't they're not artists People in my family, I don't know an artist in my family. I didn't know anybody on West Boulevard that's an artist. I didn't know any artist. So I'm sitting here like, man, I'm still cooking up this art thing on YouTube, painting, showing my friends who show their friends, still don't know any artists. I don't want to say anything wrong with my first encounter, but I want to say it was Blumenthal. I've never heard of like Blumenthal performing arts, right? Going up, I don't know anything about performing art centers. I don't know anything about arts besides like I could draw people's name in graffiti because I loved graffiti, but I didn't know graffiti was going to be something that I or like art was going to be something I was going to pursue. Right. So I got my first artist taste. God, I don't want to be wrong, please. Anybody. I don't want to be wrong with this one. But I think uh, I met. Bri was it Bree Stallings? Oh, Bree Stallings is I an met, artist uh, here in Charlotte. Yeah. I met. Uh, I, I started hearing of uh, Georgie's work. Georgie and then from there I started meeting artists like I met the Matt uh, Matt Moore's Matt Hooker's I met the John Harrison's and now uh, this was through Blumenthal we were doing the Pillars for Breaking convention and uh from there I started meeting more and more artists so so basketball players were like oh you do art you know what I'm saying it's like you transitioning from like <laughs> used to hoop so now you're doing art. Is this a real thing? It's almost like, are you serious with this? You know what I'm saying? That's, I'm like, I had friends that were like, are you really serious with this? Are you really about to do this? And I'm like, actually, y'all, yeah, I'm really about to do this. But I had really good support from my family. Like, 
I had cousins that were like, man, you do shoes? I had, I'm like, oh, I want a painting in my home. And I'm like, oh, man, you really? I look back now, I'm like, can I redo that? You know, can I redo that? <laughs> so the art scene, it grew on me because I really didn't know for real that I really would become passionate or change people's lives with art. And I started meeting some really dope people, yo, like really, really cool people with different walks of lives. And I'm like, man, art changes, art heals. And so basketball is still there, but like I say, art, it's a whole cool thing. It's a, a whole different mind flip when you not just talk about doing it. Mm -hmm. You were a basketball player, now you're an artist, but now you're saying it, it's your job. Yeah. It's your money maker. It's yeah. your it's your profession. It's your expertise. Yeah. That's weird to make that switch. Yeah. And and art is one of those jobs that people discredit so easily yeah, as not yeah. a real job or not lucrative. I look at it like, right, as women, we were taught to depend, be dependent, right? And I'm like, man, I'm so independent, right? Just you gotta find that mm, like I'm a boss. Despite, despite whatever, like, I'm a boss, I'm going to do this. And if I can't get through your door, then I'll build a door, open it, and I'll make way for other women. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, like, I don't care. Nothing's going to be given to you. My dad taught me that. Nothing in life is free, and nothing's going to be given to you. And so when you got that kind of tenacity and that attitude about it, and you're not like, oh, I'm waiting around for somebody to do something for me, or I'm waiting, and you go ahead and create that for yourself, at least you know that when something do come along, you still got this if that doesn't work. And I also appreciate you saying that you didn't know anything about art growing up in Charlotte, because know. we talk about um, social equity mm -hmm. and, and the proximity to wealth, the proximity to knowledge, the right. proximity to success, proximity to opportunity. And when people have that, they don't know what it's like to not have it. For you not to see a role model artist, to not know about museums or art or, or have that experience, you know, it, it really puts blinders on your opportunities. You look around and see your opportunities. So I'm a, I'm a, I must say this, right? Like me and my sister joke, if you ever read The Millionaire Next Door, right? or rich dad, poor dad, like you have two different scenarios, right? So my my sister works at the library, right? And here I am doing like street stuff, but we live in the same house and share the same room. We're two different people, right? She's actually an artist, right? And so I look back and I'm laughing like, man, I'm so jealous. I was jealous of you, like secretively deep down inside. Like maybe this really was my calling and something I really wanted to do, but I just went on ahead and practice and gang basketball like basketball became a thing right and so I think about like all right I was raised on West Boulevard and Wilmore right and so nobody came through with different opportunities outside of playing football outside of being a cheerleading we created our own games we were creative in a sense right but nobody brought us canvases nobody brought us paintbrushes spray paint I mean we got harassed we got so so how can you focus on anything else if this is what's happening inside your neighborhood and each day you're just trying to survive. And when you're in survival mode, how can you thrive? You can't think about anything else. You can't think about, oh, I want to paint. I don't know, but the people I hung with, we didn't, we weren't having conversations that surrounded um, bettering ourselves or getting out or painting, art, spray painting. And it's crazy because as time went forward, they, they hit me up to paint for them. So when I say I got my neighborhood support, it's actually pretty dope as a community. Like... I paint on their garage. I come in and paint canvases for people in the neighborhood or shoes for them. So it's pretty dope that I got so much support in the transition from like, I was the girl in the middle of the street doing crossovers, you know, for people. So it's pretty, I actually think it's pretty cool. It is. It yeah. really is. And, and I think it's awesome to be a role model to other young people to say dream dream yeah. about what you can be look around and see people like you in all these places so now there are little girls who maybe they're told you should play basketball or you should be a cheerleader but they see you and say it's actually not really what I, is on my heart that's crazy because i get kids i work with the youth and when they start doing art they're like man i love art so i'll be like man i tell their parents please, please harness this. And if they decide to change their mind, then uh, be open for that too. Don't don't look at it like I wasted my investment or I wasted my money getting them all this canvas. 
let them paint. I'm going to tell you the most beautiful thing my grandma did was even though I got paint all over her wood floors, which I promised her, I promised her I'm going to get it up, she never told me to stop. I'm going to tell you, she, she was like, get a trade. You need to do something with yourself. You need to do something with your life. and You need to do your best at whatever you do, right? And so she's letting me build mock walls in her backyard to spray paint. And she's allowing me the space to just spray Minus when I spray in the house and she be like, man, that stuff stinks. She let me paint in the back room. Like I had a back room in her house and she let me paint my shoes back there. She would open the door and come check on me and see what I'm doing. So I really encourage that if you see your child doing it because they're a creator and they're going to create change and make waves in this world. But but as a parent, I'm not a parent, right? But what I noticed with some parents is that because they didn't live out their dream, they try to force their child to do their dream and your child isn't you. They're a product of you, but they're not you, and they never will be you. They have pieces of your DNA, but at the end of the day, they're individuals. So harness whatever. I don't care if they want to bake, get them an easy bake. Do they even still make easy bake <laughs> ovens? You know what I'm saying? Like, get them an easy they bake. They were probably recalled because they were so dangerous. They <laughs> yeah. set the house on fire, and here we were playing with them in the bedroom. <laughs> like, man, if you see your kid growing plants and botanists, man, like, like, yeah. like encourage it. Buy yes. the books. Feed their mind. Feed their soul. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm Like I said, I'm not a parent. I can't tell nobody how to parent. I don't, according to my mom, it's a tough job. So, <laughs> you know, but I encourage that because I work with the youth. I do encourage harnessing poetry. Poet, pe poets get paid money. Yeah, it's a job. Poets get paid. Writers, that's a job. There's right? so many things out there that we still have these mental blocks on. That's not a job. Right. Um, so I'm glad that we're coming into a time where we're seeing a lot of entrepreneurs, especially because of COVID. I've got to make my own way. This job isn't taking care of me anymore. And I, or I, I can't do it anymore. I'm not happy. Life is short and people are, are chasing their calling more. Um, you talked about, and I think this goes into your obstacle. You talked about your depression and you touched on how you use art to heal. Talk about that because I think, the main thing that draws me to your work is the happiness in your work and the love, as it says, the love in your work, because I have the word love everywhere in my life, because I believe when we see it, we live it, we feel it, we, we share it, it just permeates. So talk about how you use your art to heal. What does that look like? Uh, so I was, uh, I was like so I had a lot of suicidal thoughts and this I don't even know when they started I don't know why they started actually yes I do uh, they started because I didn't feel like I was worthy enough right and what art taught me was I'm worthy of everything like all the colors let me know like man it's it's a way out like they're so bright and they're so happy and they vibrate like you know and I started cleaning myself up like I used to, I started drinking when I was like 18 I stopped at like 29 right so you got to think from 18 to 29, everything they tell you, your chemicals, your brain, all that. So I'm like off always. Sometimes I'm happy. Sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I'm this. Sometimes I'm not. Like I was all, off balance. And to the outside, for the person outside looking in, you like, the near seems so happy. The near seems so this and the near, right? Because we always judge what you, what you, what we see. We, we, we don't know. 99% of yourself you can't see. It's on the inside, right? And so inside, I'm feeling empty. I'm feeling like I got failed relationships, failed family things. So much happened up until, you know, the point where I got diagnosed with depression and, and anxiety. And so it was just, the suicide was like a way out. It's like, man, I, I could end this and I don't have to deal with depression and I don't have to deal with anxiety. And, um, what art ended up doing after I stopped thinking of it as a way for money, it became therapeutic, right? It became a way to sit with myself and it became a way, like I learned how to meditate. And with meditation came these pictures and with, some of my art would come from the meditative space, which is in me. And I cleaned up my diet and I went plant-based, right? And I noticed the change, I noticed the happiness. And I'm like, man, I'm not even like this. Like, why did I want to do that? Why did I have those thoughts? Cause I think my last attempt, um, I had too much to drink. I had too much alcohol. It was my 29th turning 30th birthday. And uh, they were giving me free shots. You know, I'm like, no, who's going to turn that down? So uh, I, I was saying a poem. I've never sp said any of my poems in front of anybody. So I knew that like, someone had a picture of me saying a poem. Well, I get a ride home from the uh, place where we were doing a poem at. <clears throat> the person who dropped me off was someone I was involved with at the time. And I threw 
my like easel out of the car when they parked. I was like so much rage because like, they ended up playing it back. We ended up being able to talk like years later. And they played it back because I told them I don't remember that night. Mm -hmm. um, but I get upstairs, I run upstairs, they said. They ran behind me. I told them to get out. I told them to get out, I'm gonna kill myself. And I went to the kitchen to grab the knife. And I got ready to put the knife between my neck and they, they put their finger. And as I'm on the ground, I told them what I heard was a faint voice that said, you don't love yourself. I've never, I've never heard anything like that. So the next day I went and this is when the art really picked up. Like this is when the art really like became the healing process. And so I, the next day went to work on myself. I had already tried little trinkets of steps, but I thought I, I needed someone to hold my hand while I did it. So I would be like, you want to meditate with me? No. And the problem not a problem, I'm sorry. What I learned was you can't make any, like the thing, your journey is your journey. Your healing process is your healing process and you don't need anyone to hold your hand. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, you gotta jump off yourself. And so what I realized, me not focusing on myself and trying to get people to come, forcing you to come on this journey with me, mm -mm, this is my time now. So the next day I started reading meditation and how do you sit with yourself and what like what is this thing what is this thing i never went to search which is love right and so uh uh first five minutes of meditation my brain is like so loud i was just like i'm i'm not gonna do this right who wants to sit here with all these thoughts going a million miles an hour and this thing i know i was just like no but you know what what other option do you have right i've been a not to say therapists are going to be the cure right but how many times in this right now like currently like what other option because now you're going to go insane if you don't figure something out so I kept pushing and pursuing meditation and next thing I know I went like and sat 45 minutes and nothing happened and I, I cried like a it came by itself like tears came by themselves and I was like man next thing I know I started hearing and and uh hearing where I needed to be where I needed to go what to do where stuff was gonna take me, the art colors got super bright. They were like, like the <laughs> green got brighter, everything got brighter. The art, I, I I threw away, I shouldn't have, majority of my old art, cause it was scary. Like I remember I had a picture of a dragon with red eyes. Like nobody even, you don't even see that, right? You don't see none of that art today. It was me releasing, trying to release what was going on internally, like the conflict I had internally. Mm -hmm. So, and um, I mean like, that wasn't, that was my, final um suicide attempt but all the other ones I look back like man what were you thinking now I'm be like man what were you thinking right like all those times what oh you don't feel worthy because of somebody else's opinion you don't feel worthy because somebody else can't fulfill something you're supposed to fulfill in yourself or you feel empty because of what you know like I look back now like man I'm so grateful to be here I am so grateful like because at the end of the day the reality is we're all got it. We all have a date with destiny and I don't determine that. You know what I'm saying? Like we all got a time clock. So. Oh my gosh. That is, <laughs> thank you for sharing that. Um, so openly, I don't think um, a lot of people have access to hearing that kind of experience so candidly um, because, you know, different people have different journeys and encounters with suicide, suicide ideation, suicide attempts, um, especially in those teen years where, you know, it can be something that you keep to yourself. Um, so for you to talk about it is, is really, really therapeutic for other people. And I know you won't see the result of every person you touch. Um, but I, I know for sure it will help. It will help people. It wasn't talked about in my home, right? Like if they're going through something, I mean, not to say they weren't supposed to tell us, right? But like, you could feel when it's tension in your home, or you can feel when somebody or something's not right. Or, I mean, it could have been DNA. I mean, it could be genetics why I was having those thoughts. But my will to want to heal and be better was way more than like wanting to end my life. And I, I really, really, really am a big advocate for therapy. Like I'm a big advocate for mental health. I'm a big advocate for like doing those things for yourself. You gotta like make sure yourself is taken care of first due to this reason. When you lay down, you lay with yourself. Even if you're laying beside somebody, you're in your skin, your body skin. When you wake up, you have your routine. You have to deal with yourself 24 seven. 
you are with you. Like, <laughs> I can't express that enough. You are with you. When you take a shower, you are with you. When you cook, you are with you. And so you got to carry this thing around, right? Like, make sure you love it. Mm -hmm. But um, something that resonated with me is that survival mode. When you are in survival mode, for whatever reason that is, there isn't time to even meditate and pause and pause your mind. Um, and so it's so important that, um, first of all, people and, and children are just so limited in having control over their own lives. But it's so important that once you have control over your own life and your own decisions and your own destiny, that you prioritize caring for yourself getting out of survival mode as best as you possibly can, even in one aspect. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're out of a bad relationship. Maybe you're away from a, a toxic family member, you know, and, and for myself, it's been incremental over 44 years. It's been incremental and it started when I was 16 and started becoming independent. Um, I started eliminating that toxicity and eliminating that damage and my survival mode got less and less and less and to the point where I was not in survival mode and then I could look inward right you know and you start trying to be okay with yourself right I think uh yeah survival mo <laughs> survival mode is a beast right and I think that I can only speak for my age demographic right because it's hard to as I once was as a youth, it's hard to think back like, dang, what would I have done at 16 or 15? You know, we don't have the tools, we don't have the resources, but I will say that you send your kids to school, right? If you don't homeschool them, I definitely believe that there should be some kind of like calming prerequisite before you start teaching, right? I'll give an example. I, I taught for it. Had, not even a year because I got fired right I got fired because I believe I believe it's because before my class would start I would have our kids do like three to five minute meditation I'm not sure if I nobody told me if I was supposed to use meditation as a word they didn't break it down but they agreed that I could do that so I would ask the kids like how you feeling they'd be like oh I'm feeling good Miss Davis or I went to the beach in my meditation or you know this is this is oh man so we get ready to do art and um, they're creating these amazing pieces. And I'm telling you, man, these are like kinda K through five. And and I'm looking like I want to cry because I'm like, man, I got a kid who just drew in kindergarten, a dump truck treehouse or all this. And they all sitting there calmly like the kids aren't rowdy. They aren't running around. They're not throwing the chairs at each other or screaming back and forth. They don't even want art to end. And so it's like, how can you start implementing in ways to at least get them down a, a notch, not to say, like we don't, I don't, I'm not at your home life. I don't know what happens, but I know for eight hours of a day, you're here with me transitioning through different periods. How can we train our, you know, educators to get these students to a space where it's like, all right, for this time, just feel safe with me. Cause I notice that I work with juvenile attention teams and I notice trust is an issue. Feeling safe is an issue. And if they don't feel safe or trust around you, like you're not giving them that space, then they're going to carry that on outside eight hours of the day. That's that's 24 hours in a day. You break that down to three, you know, eight, 16, 24. If you got them for eight, you can go ahead and start putting them in that calm space, in this space. You know, a lot of teachers say, what can I do when they go home and come back? Keep on. You keep on keeping on because one of your students or two of your students are going to take notes. They're going to carry it on. Somebody somewhere is going to keep carrying on what you talk about or what you do. Mm -hmm. So, so do you, when you, um, work with young people through art and your experience, you tell your story, what do you see happen? What is that encounter like with young people who finally have someone who may look like them, who may be where they're from, who may have interests in them? You connect so magnetically to people. Um, and now you're saying, tell me like, share, share. What it's, is that um, like? it's dope. Cause they come in and they're like, oh, like I'm from this I'm from this background, I got this, and I'll be like, man, that's cool and all, you know what I'm saying? But like, this is this is where I'm from, and this is what I did, and these are my experiences, and some of them, some I've had some of them be like, man, I thought my situation, until they hear my story, right, I start breaking down things that have happened, and how I got to where I'm at, and the amount of peace I have. We'll start using art, I'll be like, write your aggression and your poetry, you know what I mean? We'll get you studio time, we'll get you this, and. Just making sure to fulfill through with your promise with them because I, what I learned about kids is breaking their promise is breaking their heart. And what I learned also learned about kids is, you know what I mean, time. I'm giving them my time, right? So I'm like, all right, how can you get through 
And they're actually giving me their time, right? They don't have to listen to me. Like nobody's forcing you to do anything you don't want to do. Even though that teacher might be like, I'm going to send you out. So, so the kid mentality is so what? I don't really have much to lose. I'm already in this space. I mean, I work with kids who have ankle monitors on, right? So I work with all types, walks of life of kids. And to see the joy, I'd be like, man, you really ain't even as tough. Like art softened you up like a brownie. You're not even as hard as you think you are, right? And I get to telling them like how I used to dodge bullets growing up as a kid or how I sold drugs. And I started talking about the numbers on the scale and it gets them like, oh, she's relatable. Oh, I calm down. And I, I say, I'm not glorifying the things that have happened or the things that done. I'm just telling you that, hey, we cool. We cool, and this is where I want, I see your, I see you going a different way, you know what I'm saying? So for me, it's like, all right, what's something you really desire? I had one kid, he really want to bake, but he really had this shell over him because he was like, you know, people going to look at him like a baker, and he going to be clown. The biggest, the biggest thing I'm learning is kids don't want to be picked on. They don't want to be criticized for something they genuinely love. Like, if a kid loves picking up stones and creating earrings, and he's a guy and it doesn't seem like it's a guy, a manly thing to do, he doesn't want to be picked on. So he puts on this, this, this manly, tough guy thing, and I got to prove my worth, right? I got to prove who I am. And so when these kids get in my presence, everybody's so excited to show me they work, to show me they shoes, to show me they writings, to show me... Or the next class, they bring their books of sketches. And I'm like, you were sketching? I, I Sometimes I'm like, man, you can't draw. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. I'd be like, man, you you show me that. Let me see that. You know what I'm saying? And they're like, I can do this. And it's just instilling that, you know, Kurt, I can do this. And um, knowing that they come from a similar background, right? Just letting them know, hey, man, for real. Oh, you want to open up a business? Oh, you want to open up a school? Oh, you want to be this? Then you got to stop doing that. And I'm, I'm not, you know, if you don't stop doing that, this is consequences. You know, I'm not, hey. Mm -hmm. So it's like I get this sparkle. Like, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm not a big crier, but if I was, I probably would cry every time. Like, <laughs> I get this like, dang, man, they really listening to you. They really listen. I've had um this past summer I did a camp with CMPD, right, and we had 80 kids. And uh, all the kids were talking prior, and they introduced me, did an activity. And the activity was close your eyes. And it was like, no, no, no. And I was like, why? We don't trust you. We don't trust We don't trust people. I said, oh, yeah, I got trust. Okay. I said, man, close your eyes, close your eyes. I said, you can trust me. Close your eyes. So a few of them did, a few of them did. You know, I said, breathe in, breathe out. Like we did four breaths in, four, breath, four seconds in, four seconds out. So next thing I know, I told them to scream, like, I am amazing, real loud. I was like, that's not loud enough scream I, I want you guys to rock this house scream I'm amazing so they did it I said all right all right all right calm down calm down can I get on my chair and I started telling my story and it was it was great because we were with the police and I was I told them I was like man I'm gonna be honest my encounters with the police you know what I mean they were terrible and I was just like you know I started telling my story about how I sold drugs and how I did it, how I got caught, and da da da, and da da da, and then I started telling them how my grandma got diagnosed with cancer, and my dad been shot, my mom, and some kids were like, man, like you know, like, dang. and it was quiet. So when you're able to like penetrate and let them know, like, hey, somebody else has had it bad, has had it worse than you, or what little thing you think you're going on because somebody took your phone away from you, or like, and not to say that some kids don't have bad, some kids really do have really bad situations that it's just like, it's gonna take a lot to get them up out of, or, you know, they gotta get the proper resources. But in the moment, my, my voice is just to penetrate and let you know, hey man, you can be somebody despite any obstacle, despite any hurdle, you can, you can be somebody. I also love um, that you're doing what you're doing because, even the children who have really overwhelming obstacles in their home life and in their personal lives, when they see someone that got through it, somehow it's a light of hope that there, this isn't forever. I'm going to get through this. There is a chance. There's another chance. Um, because too many times, I think, they bring in guest speakers and we assess, we, we assess everybody and we're like, oh, you don't look like you've had a very hard life. You know, you don't, you don't look like it's been difficult. And so um, it's awesome that you're able to share. Um, I, I just don't even, I don't even have the words to near, honestly, because I'm just so overwhelmed by the imagining the feeling that you're giving 
these students, these children, these young people that don't get it in very many places. Um, it's like when you start to like love yourself as much as I like grew to like pour in my cup, then like life starts or universe people start pouring in you until your cup just has so much that you can just start giving and giving and never get empty, you know. So when I walk in a space I feel it out and I'm like, man, this is gonna be fun. Right, and I want the one that thinks they're the toughest. I want the one because you get them to crack a smile, and it's like, man, you not, you know, it's it's cool. It's it's for real. I never, I honestly never imagined anything of this nature. I never. So I started, you know, I wrote in my, I did write in my journal, and manifestation started happening. But prior, mm -mm, I couldn't see this happening. I I couldn't. Mm, yeah. That's beautiful. What is the biggest art thing that you've done that you're so proud of to this point? Because I know you are <laughs> so early on in your calling, but it's so powerful already. And so each mural holds something. Yeah, I know where I was in that space. Mm. I know I kind of can't remember on some of them what I was wearing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Or what so color my mask it's was. It's not just a skill set that shows up in the artwork. It's your emotional state. It's your mental state. It's where you were in that time with that. Like a snapshot of yeah. you on the wall yeah like uh on Graham street i was like man i want colors like i want i want when you ride past this you just i just want your day to be like there's nothing happening on Graham street in the moment when i was doing that i was like there's nothing happening of course now you know camp north end has built up um actually camp north end is 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 dope it's full of dope art. So, but at the time, if you ride on Graham on this side and look up past Family Dollar, like nobody's ever done art over there. It's by where Delahay Course, you know, currently still halfway is and used to be. And it's like, who's over here uplifting this community? Who's over here bringing light to this space? I grew up like I used to ride the bus over there, right? Now I think they have a mural on the backside, but in my moment, in my time, I was like, I want to bring something, live it. And so, right, people started coming to me and telling me their stories. And so it's almost as if you're painting their stories from the backside or like, you, you know this used to be that, or you know, right, like, or are they gonna get where the Wayne's is the neighborhood grocery store? What are we gonna do? And it's like, man, like, I, I just wanna give you some kind of hope, some kind of love, like, you gotta feel this. Mm. Yeah, so it's like each piece is my feeling in that moment, right? And then you move on. Mm. So to say, Right now, it's the greatest. I, th I think each one, like, because each one is different, and each piece is different. Each can is different. Why, um, why were you so drawn to the word love specifically? That night, you don't love yourself, like, you know that, like, you don't love, you know, that? and it was faint too, like, you don't love yourself. It's like, man, you don't love your love. And it's like, think about it, right? Think about the frequency of love. Think about the vibration of love. Think about love. It's like bliss. It's like everything positive, right? When you think about, I love cookies. I love, this is my favorite. I love to do this. I love speaking. When you say it, you say like, I love it. That's that's the thing you want to do, be around. Um, it gives you good feeling. I don't know. Love is, is it's my thing, man. Mm -hmm. like, like you can speak love to another human through your heart without even saying I love you. You can vibrate at a high level. It makes people want to be around you. It makes people want to, like, protect you. Because with love, you protect, you know. Mm -hmm. So And love, what beautiful. they say, love doesn't boast. It doesn't brag. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yeah. The whole, the, all of the, the whole stanza of what love is. It really is a good way to lead our lives and our encounters with others. Um, and it's, it sounds as if, and what I've seen from your social media and the videos of the kids that you interact with, the young people you interact with, you're sh you're just loving them. You're loving them under no conditions. Um, and that's not something we get very often. You also see them and you reveal yourself to them. And unfortunately, those are things that human beings don't get a lot and children even less so, you know. I think it's because as we were conditioned as adults, right, um, whatever your bring, upbringing was, you have a condition, right? Like in my home, up until my father got shot, we didn't say I love you, right? And like leaving is like either see you later or I'm out the front door, like, and it's like, boom, my dad got shot and the guy almost killed him. And think about that. The last thing I said to my dad was see you later. Mm. That wasn't necessarily almost true. 
And so as he's recovering, and which took away, and they said he uh, he might not make it, right? So you imagine hearing that. You imagine being the last thing you say to someone to see you later, and that necessarily might not come true. And then you get a doctor coming in and saying he might not make it, right? And so it's like, dang, man, I'm, we didn't say I love you. So I think back, like, man, when not really, like, I remember texting my grandma, I love you, and she was like, are you okay? Like, you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, for me, I'm like, man, this child might not be getting this, or this adult in the store might not know what it's feel like, but when you walk past them and you radiate this thing, and they do a double take, or they do a look, and then they get to talking to you, and you start giving them little trinkets, that's love. Love is giving away pieces of you, you know what I'm saying? Knowing that you still got enough to keep giving around and around and around. Love is giving. Mm. Like, that's all, for real. It makes sense to reflect back on what you said earlier about how your family supported you so much. So you can have support in your family and bond in your family, but not love. And then if you don't get love, then you don't know how to love yourself because you haven't seen it. One of my One of my cousins was like, I think, like, I was like, man, we was grew up raised on, like, tough love, right? Or they mentioned that, I guess the, this point was just because it wasn't said, that it was shown. Um, I was like, well, I like, you know, I like to hear it. And I'm saying what I say it all the time, but I think it's nice if someone, because some people go off of words, some people go off feelings. Everybody is, you know, built differently. Some people might not want to hear. I don't know. But, you know, Tough love, I don't know if that's really like a a, a thing. I, like I think, I think love love is love is soft. As I got older, I'm like, man, tough love? If that's tough love, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think uh I I, I don't know. I think like, it's tough, a defense it's like, mechanism. I, yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as we're talking, I'm like, man, is that like an oxymoron? Tough love. Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean Probably think about the people yeah. who gave you tough love. They weren't necessarily nurturing, loving. It, it was punishment veiled with, <laughs> boundaries veiled with, this is good for you, but don't ask why, is kind of yeah. my experience with tough love. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Now that we're sitting here, I'm like, man, yeah, that, yeah, that actually makes no sense. It doesn't. <laughs> it makes it no, doesn't. And it, but what it did was it, uh, it made me stronger, right? And so even when I went and told my dad, like, hey, I'm going to pursue this this love thing and he's like oh man you're not gonna be able to get people to love one another or you're not or you know love that's gonna be and I'm like watch me you know like at anything I love about him is I'm like watch me do this thing right and he looks back he's like baby I'm proud of you think about that think about think about you got your family well my immediate I don't I can't I got a big family so my immediate family right and it's like ah oh, this and all that and I'm like yeah all right Let's do it because you got to be the product, right? If I don't genuinely love myself, you would know, you know, if I'm not really happy, I think now, you know, you would know. Like before it was kind of like, it was, it was fake. It was fake happiness. And then I'd be in my room or at my house, like, I don't know, drinking a bottle, writing this or doing, you do that behind closed doors and then I go out and I got, my smile is even different. I had a friend say, man, your smile is different. Your skin is different and things are different. They notice the glow in you, right? So. And now you're addicted to it. I am addicted <laughs> to it. I'm addicted to the frequency, the vibration, anything that vibrates lower. I'm like, uh, I'll give you this little piece here, but you got to go figure it out for yourself because I don't want it. Uh, I'm fine. And I've had a hard life, right? Like, who wants to go backwards? Who wants to go backwards? When, you, when you've been drugged through the mud, like, right, or drug, even if you drag yourself, who wants to go backwards? And then, like, you know, I got these bigger goals. Like, I, you got to pour love into these goals, man. You got to love what you do because these things are big. They're big. That's exactly right. I think that's a wonderful place to stop and, and let people hear your words and feel them and, and resonate and meet you at your frequency. Thank you very, very, very much. I'm honored that this is how I got to meet you in person because this is this is a gift and I appreciate it. Thank oh, you so much. Dope. You're pretty dope. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> With every episode of the She Dreams in Color video series, we like to have a t-shirt that you can purchase that will help continue amplifying the message that was shared during the interview. This t-shirt says continue with the semicolon. The semicolon has become a symbol for continuing on beyond suicide ideation or suicide attempts. 
it's important to remember that there is another chapter to the story. This t-shirt was designed by Sisterhood Designs twin 19 year olds and you can find their information down below in the bio. It's our turn. Won't let it burn. It's our turn. Won't